Hi, everybody. Welcome to The Other People Show. I'm Brad Listy, and I am your host. I'm in Los Angeles. It is good to be with you. I appreciate you tuning in. It is Friday, so it is time for another flashback episode where I dig into the Other People archives and share an outtake from an episode from years past. Today, I will be sharing an outtake from episode 436, my conversation with author Wendy C. Ortiz. It first aired on October 19th, 2016. Wendy Ortiz was born and raised right here in Los Angeles. She is the author of several books, including Excavation, a memoir, Hollywood Notebook, and a dreamoir entitled Bruja. Her work has been featured in a variety of publications, including the LA Times, The Rumpus, The LA Review of Books, The New York Times, and Story Quarterly. She is a psychotherapist in her civilian existence. Always fun talking with Wendy C. Ortiz, and I am excited to be sharing with you a flashback to our conversation back in 2016. That is coming up in just a second. A quick reminder to please subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen. You can also subscribe on YouTube. Follow the show on social media, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and Blue Sky. And if you want to get my weekly email newsletter in your inbox, you can subscribe for free over at Substack. And if you would like to join the Other People Patreon community, help keep this show going into the future, go sign up over at patreon.com slash other ppl pod that's patreon.com slash other ppl pod all right so on with the show let's get to today's flashback from episode 436 my conversation with wendy c ortiz it first aired on october 19th 2016 a quick reminder that the full episode is available in the feed. So if you want to hear the full conversation, just go look for episode 436. It is there waiting for you. All right. All right, let's do this. Here I am in conversation back in 2016 with Wendy C. Ortiz. It's a book about dreams. It could be considered a dream journal, but it's like a life that I lived overnight in my sleep. It was written around the same time as the text for Hollywood notebook. So which is your previous book? Yes. My previous book. So between like 2001 to 2005, the text was written. So, so were, were these dreams you, happened. Are you recording your dreams? Are you somebody who has vivid dreams and like keeps a dream journal? I used to. I think it really ended around my kid. I don't and they ruin everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I don't have the vivid dreams that I used to have. And I definitely don't record them anymore unless something stands out. If it's like a person or a phrase or a fruit or something weird that stands out, then I'll record it. But it's not, it it doesn't feel like it even happens every night that I remember them. So I've given up on it. It's been years. Last night, my wife or this morning, my wife was like, do you remember waking up last night and asking me if river farted? (laughs) I woke up because I sleep so lightly. We have the baby monitor still. Uh-huh. And I, I think in my sleep, I thought I heard my <laughs> child fart. And then I thought I heard my wife laugh. <laughs> and so I woke up and I was like, did he just fart? And it turns out my wife was not awake. She was dead asleep. Oh. And so she just heard me. Like I woke her up in the middle of the night. Whoa. And I was like, did he just fart? She's like, what are you? <laughs> She's like, do you, why did you wake me up to ask me that? And I was like, I thought you were awake and laughing. I was like half asleep in some sort of. I like, sleep with earplugs now. And oh. it, yeah, it's kind of weird. It's like I never slept with earplugs until I was pregnant, like really deep in pregnancy. And I was just like, oh my God, I just need to turn everything off. And now I can't sleep without them. Well, so we use a fan. Like my wife, neither my wife nor I can sleep without a fan running like full blast, which oh. it drowns out a yeah. lot of sound. Yeah. So I think it performs the same Now function. I feel like I have to have like something in my ears to just block everything out, which is kind of scary. I mean, in the first few months of my kid being here, it was like, no, I, I can't use earplugs. I have to be able to hear everything. But then probably when she was around five or six months old, it was back to earplugs. And now I have to I don't to have care them. if you're screaming for food. <laughs> Mommy needs her sleep. I did my time. Yes. 
Uh, so, okay. So you have a lot, you know, you used to at least have uh, a lot of very vivid dreams. Yeah. And I've what, been recording them for many, many, many years, even before this. Are you finding narrative in them? Are you, fi- are you finding uh, just imagery that then provokes narrative in your writing? Or like, you know what I'm saying? Like, what do they look like? So the dreams that are in this book kind of have a narrative. And one of the things that I did was I used all the same pseudonyms for the people that I've used for Hollywood Notebook and some of my essays and excavation. So Jeff appears in this book in a dream. So I used... Who is Jeff? Let's out him right now. Oh, okay. (laughs) Do you remember? Excavation has a teacher named Jeff in Uh, it. So he appears and it's like really, really gross. Yeah, really gross, (laughs) scary dreams about him too. But... Basically, if you if you look at the text, and then of course I edited all the text because this used to all be on a website. I captured all of the text, just like Hollywood Notebook. Knew that I was going to do something with it at some point. Edited it so that there was like a hint of a narrative. I cannot tell you that there is like a narrative arc in this book, but you know, I don't know. My second book didn't have one either. Well, it's weird because sometimes dreams I'm, I'm imagining, especially in the aggregate can probably suggest something. Oh yes. So reading them all together and the way that it's edited, there is a thread of a narrative in there. And it's, for me, it's easy of course, to pick out the themes, but as I've been talking to people who have read copies of it, they are, they're seeing a narrative thread as well. So I feel like good. I want it to be very subtle, I'm, I'm not but crazy. <laughs> yeah. I'm not the only, but you know, it's like, there's a lot of animals. The same animals tend to show up a lot. There's a lot of sharks. There's a lot of like big ocean animals. You ever Google um, this? Stuff? Cause like you can find all these sorts of, right. like, you know, dream, uh, deciphering. Right. I websites. tend to, I tend not to use any dream interpretation stuff because when I was in Jungian analysis, my analyst was always like, let's just think of these dream people, animal situations as aspects of you. And if you think about it that way, then what does it mean? So it's not, it's different than if I look up in a dream dictionary, anything about cats is usually about sexuality. I can sort of go there. Like that makes sense on a certain level, but what if I am like all, like there are lots of dreams where there's like a dozen cats at my feet and like, I'm trying to count them or they're jumping out of my arms. Oh my God. (laughs) And so like, you know, I have so many dreams like that. I think it's more, you know, it's, it's, it's probably more multifaceted than just sexuality going on in there. Well, and it also, I think it also, especially if you're coming at it from an, uh, an analysis standpoint, uh, you know, you're trying to work on yourself or whatever. Like if you start to externalize all of these things, Mm -hmm and make them some kind of other, I think that you might be giving them a power that they don't deserve. Yeah, Whereas if you, if you say like, Oh, this is something from inside of me. These are aspects of me. Right. It makes it, makes it something that you could probably control better and that you would have more power over. Right. There are some people like there's, there are figures that show up in the dreams in this book that I am still curious about. I don't know who they are. And sometimes they had names, like there was a name, David Shelton and like a person who showed up in my dreams. I have never met this person in my life, but they showed up in the dream with a name. And I have a theory about this. I kind of imagine, you know, like you see babies, people are constantly putting their face, like stranger faces in the baby's face. The baby is recording all of this. It's going somewhere. And so I sometimes wonder if like these weird people that show up in our dreams, we don't know who they are, are like just random people that, you know, as children growing up, we've just recorded all of these weird faces, people, names, and then they just like show up later in a dream. I mean, that's one, I mean, that, that's as uh, workable to me as any explanation, but then there's also part of me that's like, maybe it's somebody from a past life. Maybe it's somebody from a future life. Maybe it's a fucking alien. (laughs) Totally. And that's why it's important to me to write this stuff down, you know, because I want to be able to look back at it and go, Oh, like how much, how much magical thinking do you, do you allow yourself uh, when it comes to stuff like this specifically, but then also in life generally, like, are you somebody who indulges in that? Or are you somebody who's more of a, no, you know, like not unless there's evidence. I'm not. Gonna... Oh no, no, I'm not like that at all. I feel like you cannot, you cannot prove to me whether or not certain things exist. Yes. Okay. Like there's a couch here. I see the couch, but you can't tell me that aliens don't exist or ghosts don't exist. Like I, you can't tell me that, but you can't also, I also can't be convinced that aliens do I mean, it seems like logical to me that there are other intelligent life forms in the universe just based on its size. Sure. Like the probability seems very convincing to me. Sure. 
but like, I do not have concrete evidence that's been presented to me as of yet. Right. I like either positive or dispositive. Hmm. And so like, I'm like, right. you know, I think I'm inclined to be like, you can't tell me they don't exist. Right. I think they probably do. Right. But we're still waiting for that. And I don't, you know, a ghost to one person could be something totally different to another person. And if somebody that I know tells me that they've seen a ghost, I believe them. I feel like, okay, you had that experience. I haven't had that experience that I know of. I want to. Yeah, I want to too. No I grew ghost. up. They don't never visit me. I know. I grew up with um, a grandmother who was constantly telling me things like, if a UFO landed in the street right now, I would get on it and go. Or like, she would tell me when I die, I'm going to try and get in touch with you. You know, like I'm going to do my best. If God lets me, I'm going to try and get in touch with you. And like, she would base it off of twilight zone episodes, like the episode where the telephone wire, like they find out that the telephone wire is in some graveyard and like somebody keeps getting a phone call, but nobody says anything. And it's because the telephone wire is like connected to a grave or something. <laughs> like my grandmother would say, you know, if I can do that, I will try to do that. My grandmother's now been dead for like five years and I haven't had any visitations that I'm aware of. Any dreams? No, Yeah. no. Yeah, I mean, I had a buddy of mine die when I was in college and I had one very vivid dream where I was in a very nice restaurant, which was, uh, it was like almost like black tie Ooh. and, or I was wearing a suit, you know, just very mm -hmm. unusual for me to be at a dinner like that. And I remember looking across the restaurant and he was there and he just looked at me and smiled. And I'm like, I woke up. <gasps> Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. But that's it. I never get shit like that. Yeah. And then who knows? That was just a dream. I mean, I don't know what that was. I mean, my preference is like, I'm going to stay open to this stuff. I feel like I am a person who believes in synchronicity. So I, if I'm open to it and if I notice it, when it happens, it starts to happen more and I'm not always conscious of it, but when it's like really big and sticks out, then it's like, Ooh, okay. Something is at work here. I'm going to pay attention to it. So I feel like I tend to keep myself open to anything like, okay. you know, I, it's a good way to be, it, it can't be disproved to me. Right. So and it's better than being like closed and like, cause like the, like the word that comes to mind for me is certainty. Right. You're not, I'm not certain. Can, yeah. How could you be certain? Totally. So at the same time though, I don't want to indulge in ridiculous bullshit. So like what would be the line that you wouldn't cross in terms of indulging in ridiculous bullshit? Well, it's a little complicated because you know, you have people like, like for example, you have people who like get into the whole fairy thing. Yeah. Like oh my gosh. I used to be that when like, I was a teenager. Like Tori Amos world <laughs> where it's like there's sprites and fairies. And I think I'm going to, I'm going to say that like, I'm somewhat along the lines of what we've been discussing. Like I can't disprove it. <laughs> right. <laughs> but when it comes to drawing a line, I would say, I'm not going to spend any time on that. Right. Right. Like I can't. Fairies might exist, maybe, but hey. I'm not going to go on the journey to find fairies. Well, and I've been reading, uh, I was reading, uh, just this past week, I was trying to read true hallucinations by Terrence McKenna. Oh yes. I have a copy of that. And I, you know, I really love listening to him speak. Like he's a, he's an incredible like extemporaneous mm -hmm. speaker. And, uh, there's all sorts of stuff on YouTube and podcasts and stuff like sure. that. And it can be very, very, very interesting to listen right. to. He's a very bright guy, but the book didn't do it for me. It's hard stuff to write about. A. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then secondly, I was like, dude, I think like you guys just did too many mushrooms in the Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> like that was, I, I didn't get nearly the, de the depth charge that I get from hearing him speak. I don't know what it was, but, um, I guess I can, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I can find myself like, cause he sees a UFO. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of unexplainable stuff oh. uh, that happens down there. Oh, and okay. so, but it's, it's, it's hard to articulate uh -huh. the, the psychedelic experience. It's hard to articulate the dream experience. Yes. The two, yes. the two actually have something in common. Uh, yes. I think, yes. you know, there's some similarities there. And, um, I, I guess it's just, it's hard to make a convincing case, right? You know, after the fact, it's I sort of, it's gotta be experienced. Almost. Yeah. I mean, so I don't know if you've seen books. I'm not going to talk about fairies the whole time, but <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen, there's like books out there that have like real pictures of fairies and they're taken. I think it's like early 1900s or something. And it's like the, this collection of photographs that's really well known among, you know, people who are into fairies. 
And the pictures look ridiculous, but when I was a teenager and also when I was taking a lot more drugs, I was totally open to that. And I was like, yeah, fairies, like I'm going to look for these fairies. And, you know, now I'm, I'm much further away from that experience. And, you know, like I can see how like the psychedelic experience is also a way of trying to get closer to either a dream experience or supernatural experience, paranormal. Extraterrestrial. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a lot of what McKenna Uh supposes is that there's like an extraterrestrial element. And when you talk about fairies, I mean, like, I mean, not to spend too much time on this, but I've always been like haunted slash fascinated by what they describe in the uh, DMT experience as the machine elves. Have you ever heard of this? No. Uh, apparently when you do DMT, which is a very potent, but very brief, uh, it's like, it's a very short lived hallucination. It's like seven to 15 minutes, Oh. but it's extremely intense. Whereas like acid, it's like a 12 hour commitment or whatever. Uh, this is like, you know, you smoke it, you sit back and like for 15 minutes, it's, you're just gone. And he reports that he goes into like a kind of dome and these like self dribbling metallic (laughs) basketballs that are like little with little elfin voices. Every single time he goes there, like surround him and sort of sing to him and like, (laughs) wow. But is that just limited to him or do Uh, other people? I think other people, other people report machine elves, which, which, how far from fairies is machine elves? I think, right. is, I think is my point. Right. It's like the more masculine fairy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Women are like, Oh my God, <laughs> fairies guys are like the machine elves. <laughs> they're, they're dribbling. They're metal. Yeah. It's so, you know, there's like weird elements in my book that are like, they're definitely places that I return to. That's the other thing. Like when you were saying, like he goes back to a place and these, these things, things appear that makes me think of a series of dreams that I was having where I would keep returning to the same place that doesn't exist. What is it? There are lots of them. Oh, okay. So like name it, one. in the book, well, in the book, one was Olympia that isn't Olympia. So, you know, I lived in Olympia for eight years. Uh, you know, if you go there physically, it looks a certain way, but every time I would show up to this place in my dreams, I knew that it was Olympia, but I'd wake up and say, oh, that's Olympia. That's not Olympia. I'd just show up. Wes Anderson's New York in Royal Tenenbaums. It's like almost New York. (laughs) Right. Like I'd show up and like some of the elements would be the same or I'd meet somebody there who, who I'd go, oh yeah. Okay. This must be Olympia. That's not Olympia. But there are also like all of these other places that I can't think of off the top of my head. But when I dream them in the dream, I am like, oh yeah, this place I've been here before. But when I wake up, that I know that the place doesn't exist. How, I keep returning there in my dreams. And, and so pre baby, how often did you, did every morning you woke, woke up and you could remember it? Not every morning. There were periods of time. Like I have a lot of different notebooks over the years. So it's like maybe a couple years here, I would start to write all my dreams down and then I would let it go. And then I'd start it back up. And the last times that I was doing it, it's like, I would wake up in the middle of the night and write a little like you know, you could barely read it the next morning, just like a few key words. So it was pretty different recording than when I had all of this time and energy to like wake up the next morning and write it all out, you know, Olympia. That was not Olympia. Yeah. I like that. (laughs) Olympia. Yeah. Uh, okay. So when it comes to your professional work in psychotherapy or as a psychologist, yep, psychotherapy. So psychotherapy, Mm -hmm. does that give you insight into, I mean, you talked about being in Jungian Jungian Uh analysis Uh and, uh, you know, how that can give one perspective on Uh their dream life. Like, is there anything else that you glean from, you know, that side of yourself that allows you to understand your dream, Mm. you know, your dream existence or what those things, like what do dreams, what function do they perform for human beings psychologically? Well, I don't know if I can answer that, but I feel like, because it also would probably be different. Everybody could answer that differently. Right. I feel like now what I look to in my dreams is I probably do look for answers to questions. Like, you know, there's the very common, like if you're trying to work something out in your head, like maybe ask it before you go to sleep and then maybe Does an my answer. Son have well, gas? <laughs> 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 or, you know, how do I finish this novel? Right. You know, like what's Which I'm the trying ending? To do. In case you don't listen to the show ever, except for this one, <laughs> I've been complaining about trying to finish my novel for like six episodes in a row. So, you know, like 
I, I actually feel like that's how I got the ending for Bruja was like, I didn't know how I was going to end it because it's just a series of dreams. What dream do you end on? Like which one is the most significant dream to end on? And talking it out with people and then actually having a dream that gave me the ending was like, Oh, okay. This, this, gives, is how this gives me hope. Uh -huh. This is what I need. <laughs> it's got to have a fucking dream. <laughs> Okay, folks, there we have it. That was my conversation with Wendy C. Ortiz. Episode 436, it first aired on October 19th, 2016. You can find Wendy on the internet at wendyortiz.com. She is also intermittently, I believe, on social media, Twitter and Instagram, if I have that correct. Her books are called Excavation, Hollywood Notebook, and in the context of the conversation that you just heard, the dream war entitled Bruja. Go get her books, Wendy C. Ortiz. Don't forget to subscribe to this show wherever you listen. You can also subscribe on YouTube. Follow the show on social media, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and Blue Sky. Subscribe to my newsletter. I would love it if you did that over at Substack. And if you enjoy this show, if you listen regularly, if you get something from it, if you love book culture, if you want to see this show continue into the future, Join the Other People Patreon community over at patreon.com slash otherpplpod. You can also sign up for the Other People Book Club. That's a thing. Do that at otherppl.com. Get an Other People t-shirt or a sweatshirt at otherppl.com. And finally, if you want to read my latest novel, it is called Be Brief and Tell Them Everything, available now in trade paperback, ebook, and audiobook editions. I narrate the audiobook, so go get it. It's my book. It's called be brief and tell them everything. All right. So coming up on Sunday, I will be in conversation with Justin Torres, National Book Award nominee. His new novel, Blackouts, is available now from Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. I had a fascinating conversation with Justin Torres coming up in about, what is it, 48 hours less than? It'll be happening on Sunday, so stay tuned.